Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. I'm your host, Luca Fiaschi. I'm the VP of data at HelloFresh. And we are here today um, to talk about data, which is the secret ingredient of HelloFresh success. I'm gonna start by introducing the company. So please, if you can go to the next slide. So if you, um, for the one of you that don't know HelloFresh so well. So HelloFresh is the number one milk kit delivery service worldwide. Um, last year, we delivered about a billion meals to everywhere in the world. We have 7 million active customers every quarter, and we are operating in 17 countries, including my mother country, Italy, and Japan, while US is still the largest market for us. It's pretty large company today. It's 17,000 employee. And what makes me most excited about it is that we have over a thousand tech and data roles that we are growing really, really fast. What we stand for, what we really want to do is to change the way that people eat forever. And if you go to the next slide, we started with our main business model, HelloFresh, which is this subscription box that you receive at home that compared to the traditional way of doing groceries, combine a digital soul with a physical product. So through our app, through our website, you can plan your meals for the next week and you can select recipes from a delicious 25 choices selection and you can get that delivered at home to your convenience. That's why people love us is because we reduce um, waste by making it very efficiently to actually receive these boxes and reducing the packaging um, and the convenience of not having to plan or shop in advance. If you go to the next slide, this was only the beginning for us. Today we are present in really a lot of countries, 17 throughout the globe with multiple brands and different food solutions products. For example, here you see some of the brands that are famous in the US, like Green Chef, Every Plate, and Factor, addressing different uh, culinary needs of the customers. What we want to become, it's the world's largest and integrated food solutions group. And there is gonna more and more brands to come and more solutions to come in the next months and years. In fact, if you go to the next slide, we, HelloFresh is in it, like at the core, a tech company that uses data and technologies to provide solutions to people to fulfill their meal needs. And what we, th what we really think about, we think about um, the four core aspects of our business, which are physical products, our supply chain and marketing and our digital product to be accelerated and reinforced by data and technology. Right now, we are the champions in our niche, which is milk kits. And having all this wealth of data and brands allows us to collect even more earnings and to capitalize on it by accelerating the way we perform in each of these disciplines. If you go in the next slide, I want to talk a little bit more about that today with our four panelists, Elena, Jessica, and Pedro. We're going to go through four uh, very exciting talks. Um, Elena, who's our senior data scientist in uh, the Data Foundation team, is going to talk about uh, the history of the data platform of HelloFresh and give some more insight how this has evolved through time. Pedro is going to talk about the pretty advanced concept, which is the data mesh and how this helps us in a key element of our data strategy, which is experimentation. I give my perspective of why I think data science is so special at HelloFresh. And then Jessica, our senior data scientist in the ML solutions team is gonna talk about an interesting data science applications, which is recommendation engines. I'll leave some time for QA at the end. So feel free to write your questions in the Slack channel. Somebody's gonna collect them and it's gonna like, they're gonna address them at the end. But I'll leave this to Elena and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the introduction. 
So uh, without further ado, uh, let's start this journey through the history of data platform at HelloFresh. Next slide, please. So when HelloFresh started as a company in uh, 2011, the data infrastructure in itself was composed by two operational monoliths, one for uh, the front end and one for the back end. And uh, for the analytical plane, we were simply using some simple Google Sheet based reporting. Obviously, this was not an easily scalable solution. Next slide, please. As the company grew, the data platform did as well. So in 2015, we actually had our own analytical monolith, which was mirroring the two monoliths uh, from, from the operational plane. And our monolith was built on an Hadoop cluster. We also had a central data team, which was handling all the data assets used for business intelligence and data science. Next, please. Then in 2017, HelloFresh went public and it grew not only from, the, from a business perspective, but also in the numbers of employees that were uh, working there. The data warehouse residing in the analytical monolith continued to grow as well as the number of requests that we were receiving from the business, uh, from the business and the data science alike. And also the number of technologies were increasing. This led to many challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the slides, uh, some of the challenges that we, um, we had with this analytical monolith were the fact that as a solution in itself, an, an analytical monolith cannot scale as much as we needed. The central data team was siloed away from the actual business teams and it was maintaining all the um, data assets and uh, answering to all the requests that uh, uh, they were receiving. And in general, this was a very complex environment, which was both difficult to maintain and to onboard new people to. This ultimately led to a slower innovation and also a lack of trust in the quality of our data assets. Next, please. So what did we decide to do? We decided to simply move away, well, not simply, but we decided to move away from this monolith approach and transition to a data mesh one. My colleague Pedro will actually talk to, um, to talk to you more about this later. So this is a sort of a sneak preview. From a technology perspective, the data from our sources will be ingested into our S3 storage through Kafka, and then will continue to be processed with Spark. These Spark pipelines will be running on domain-owned EMR cluster, or as it happens for some teams, including the US team, uh, we're also working with Databricks. Additionally, in order to guarantee that the process data is highly reliable from a data quality perspective, we are integrating SODA in our ETL and ELT processes, but we have many more tools currently being implemented. Finally, for the analytics use cases that we have, we can imagine data science, exploratory analysis, uh, uh, dashboarding, reporting. We want to use the best technology for, for them. And uh, we are currently working with Snowflake, with Trino, with Databricks, and all these different technologies are all taking advantage of the information contained in the Glue data catalog. Next slide, please. This new approach is not only about the technologies though. We also went from having a central data team maintaining the analytical monolith to having multiple domain teams, each with access to their operational sources and with the possibility to build their domain specific lake house through the usage of a data hub. This data hub will provide them with capabilities like ingestion as a service, computation as a service, the data catalog, and many more. Since most use cases require data coming from different domain, these teams need to be context aware of each other. This connection is represented in the image by this cube and the domain teams themselves will be, um, are currently creating, will be creating in the future and are currently creating conform dimensions. Next slide, please. So as I said, the data hub is one of the main ingredients of our new approach. And a very important part is the self-service data platform. This platform will allow teams to be autonomous in managing their sources and data assets. And at the same time, it will ensure that there is a consistency in the technologies and the processes used by the different domains. To achieve this, we turned our central team in multiple core teams that provides education, 
self-service tooling, infrastructure to the domain teams to remove all the domain agnostic work. The example I'm going to talk to you about today is the implementation and integration of data quality monitoring in domain-owned data pipelines. Next, please. Until now, the data quality issues were usually being discovered and reported by the users of said data assets, which means at the very end of the analytical layer, the right side of this image. In this situation, each domain wishing to integrate data quality checks would have had to assess different solutions and integrate them, with the result of an inconsistency of how data quality is achieved across different domains. But if we think about it, data quality monitoring is per se domain agnostic, and it's the perfect candidate for a self-serve solution. The domains can create their domain-specific data quality checks and integrate them easily through a domain agnostic solution in the existing architecture. Next slide, please. But in what consists the solution then? We have created a data quality operator that uses Soda SQL to run user-defined inputs, which are transformed into SQL queries, to be used as tests against the data assets. It is a custom Airflow operator based on the Kubernetes pod operator, which makes it easy to maintain Python dependencies. And being an Airflow operator also provides high and higher flexibilities, as it can be plugged in in almost any workflow. Its flexibility is also reflected in the wide range of data quality checks that the domain can write. It is also compatible with the target architecture, but it has a backward compatibility to run tests on data assets still living in the legacy stack. We are using the Spark dialect for Soda SQL, and we are saving our metrics and test results to S3. And on top of this, we're also using, using Soda Cloud for automated monitoring and reporting. Next slide, please. In this image, we can see a bit more in details what is the architecture of our data quality monitoring solution. As the scheduler, we have our Airflow on, on Kubernetes. On the left side, we can see our ETL process. Once the metadata is updated and the information sent to Glue, a new task using the data quality operator is scheduled to run. This operator will use Soda Spark to run the user-defined data quality checks on a domain-owned EMR cluster and will save the results to S3. These results can also be sent to Soda Cloud, which will handle the monitoring and alerting in case a data quality issue is found. Next slide, please. Taking a real case uh, scenario, we can talk about uh, Global BI. Global BI is uh, one of our domain teams and is responsible for a wide range of critical assets in the company. Their main problems were that in order to have data quality, they needed to have specialized uh, tech knowledge required in team, and they were also experiencing uh, lower trust on the data quality of their uh, tables. And our solution, the standardized self-serve data quality monitoring, helped them in uh, resolving them. Regarding the specialized tech and business knowledge needed, they went from having the need to have separation of roles where the data engineers were responsible to own and integrate the data quality checks from start to finish, to having said a cross-functional collaboration within the team. The data engineers are still um, maintaining the infrastructure and the data analyst can create the domain-specific checks and potentially also integrate them by themselves directly in the existing ETL pipelines, thanks to the detailed guidelines. Then the data quality went from being inconsistent and having low trust to having, to have instead policy and tooling are built around it, and the monitoring and alerting went from being manual to automated. Next slide, please. In this slide, we can see how the collaboration looks like. The data analyst designed the quality checks, which we can see on the right side, and the data engineer create a new task in the existing ETL with a method create data quality operator. This method requires some information to be passed, most notably the location of the scan YAML file, which is the actual um, configuration file where the data quality checks are defined. In the example shown, um, one of the tests is uh, counting how many rows we have with minus one for the FK subscription, and we want to be alerted in case the number is above 5,000. Next slide. 
So after integrating the data quality operator, the situation for Global BI changed from this very headache inducing manual reports on Slack to, next slide please, a clean automated Slack report that easily provides what data quality test was not satisfied. It provides information about when it failed, or what failed, and also how it failed. So it's in a, in a matter of speaking, it's sometimes not enough to know that a data quality check failed, but you also want to know uh, by how much. In this case, uh, we want to be alerted when the number is above 5,000. In this case, we notice that it's above 20K. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we went from having a centralized data team maintaining a very complex analytical monolith and all the data assets for different use cases and business domain in the company, which meant creating a bottleneck for the day-to-day -day job of data analysts and data scientists to, next slide please, a decentralized data platform where we have the core teams providing a self-service platform to the different cross-functional domain teams, which on their own have data engineers, data analysts and data scientists all collaborating together to create and maintain their own data assets, the conform dimensions that will be used by other domains, and all this can be achieved by using the self-service self tooling offered by the core teams. One of such tools is uh, currently enabling the domain teams to create a domain-specific data quality checks to ensure that the highest level of data quality is achieved for their data assets. Thank you all for uh, uh, walking through this journey with me and back to Luca. Thank you very much, Elena. And I can't really like and stressing really the importance of this data platform that really empowers the analytics teams decentralized in every business unit to make really an impact for the business. And now I'm gonna lead it to Pedro, our senior data engineers in the experimentation team is gonna show us concretely how this is important for his domain. Great, thank you very much, Luca. Well, so the title of my talk is a little bit clickbait, right? So from mess to mesh and, and basically how we're going to do like with experimentation metrics. So it is to basically talk a little bit about the data mesh and especially how can we translate some of their concepts to an actual uh, project. So next slide, please. Great. So let's do like a quick recap of the data mesh and the concept is basically that it's a decentralized socio-technical approach to basically close the gap between operational plane and the analytical plane, right? So there are four key principles that we have in the data mesh and the principles are in the image we can appreciate there. So in the image we see like we have domain oriented teams, right? And the idea is like the team that is handled the operational part and the analytical part, they should sit together and cooperate and work together. So the idea is like we have the, some analogous Objects. So, so in the operational plane, we will have a microservice or some sort of application. But in the analytical plane, we will get this concept, that these hexagons that will be treated as data products. Right. So to work together in, in, in these domain-oriented teams, we need to have a self-service data platform. So the idea is like, you know, people should be worrying about the domain logic, and we should have a team helping us to provide the infrastructure. On the top, we can appreciate the federated government or governance. Right? And the idea is like, as we were mentioning, like data quality requires domain specific knowledge. So trying to enforce something across the whole domain is incredibly difficult. So the idea is like, let's provide tools again so teams can enforce their own governance policies and they can continue, right? So these are the principles and we really saw some of the tools that we have. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a little bit, what is a data product and some of the properties, right, that they have. So a data product, if you see on the image, you can appreciate that we have some hexagons and some boxes inside it. And this is analogous to a data pipeline. So basically a product contains a pipeline, but more than that, right? It also has to expose data and has to consume data. So also some of the properties we would like to have for this product is like, they need to be discoverable, right? We want to understand where do they live, what is going with them, what happens. They need to be addressable. We need to know where the data is living, what is there and how can we find it. Also, we need to know like, of course, trustworthiness of this product. And the idea is, you know, data quality, some of them, but we have SLOs, SLAs, time checks, when, when is the data arriving? You know, also like things about being able to interoperate, right? This is the, like, you know, we need to have some polyglot interface and the idea is they need to be secure. 
and they need to be like describing some business process. So next slide. Next slide, please. Whoop, a few slides back. <laughs> okay, there, uh, next. Okay, great, thank you. So then when we have this data product, let's do, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of like what it's a data product inside, how it looks like. So basically the anatomy of the data product is like, we need to understand that it's the architectural quantum of a data mesh, right? An, an architectural quant quantum is basically the minimum unit of deployable component that have a cohesive function, right? So basically this is coming from, you know, uh, books. So basically like the evolutionary architectures and the idea is like, this is the minimum thing that I need to deploy together. And to get a data product, you need the infrastructure where the product is running, the data, right? That, you know, primary component, but also the code, AKA pipeline as people want to call it. So also we see this concept of ports, that is we are getting data into the product, right? But also we need to publish data outside the product. And hopefully the domain team should be working together to provide input, uh, like output ports outside so other teams can consume and reach the data. So next slide, please. So this concept is a little bit, you know, difficult to grasp and how it looks like. So it is like, how can we apply this data product thinking to the experimentation metrics problem. Like we have, how can we actually put this into paper? So next slide, please. So let me introduce you experimentation at HelloFresh. So um, basically that my team uh, goal is to advance the velocity and quality of experimentation to make data-driven decisions across the whole organization, right? So experimentation is something in our daily life. It's a very nice place to be. I know all the new features that are coming out. So it's very nice. And we have a very interesting uh, framework to do it. So that is like, you know, we have a cycle of experimentation. People go from concept to designing the experiment, then to finally launching and monitoring the results. And then when they get analysis and then uh, interpret the results to make a decision. So we do experiments on almost every component of the platform, like design changes need to be tested by uh, experiments feature or flow or processes changes, we also test them. And also like price changes, we also test them. And we do it by using advanced statistics and we use base factors. That's why we have this kind of Bayesian uh, images. Also, we have automation and integration. And we of course handle a lot of data to generate insight. And experimentation seems like a simple problem, right? When you want to put some metric, like you collect some data, but it's a little bit more tricky than that. So next slide, please. So this was the previous process to bring a new data, to bring a new metric or a KPI to experimentation, right? So we need a KPI as a target that we want to improve and we will try to use it as an experiment. The problem is like, you know, normally the flow was like one team is creating a KPI request. Like I want to have this data available to my experiments. And you can see that we have some dots around and the green will be the external team and the blue will be the experimentation team. So then basically the Someone needs to come to the team and ask for the KPI. Then we go back to them and we want to basically sit down together and understand the metric. Then basically we go to our laptops and start implementing in, in code. And the implementation was mostly ad hoc SQL queries, right, that we're building. And then we have this back and forth cycle of, okay, it's a KPI correct, is the number correct in understanding what we need to change, is the right meaning that we're using. And finally, we were able to like incorporate the KPI in the experimentation platform. And already you can see like a lot of back and forth cycle, like, you know, a lot of like going somewhere and understanding over and over again. So you see a lot of duplication of effort, duplication of data, because something is already like providing this data somewhere else. And especially a duplication of com compute, right? So, you know, and then with duplication came inconsistency, right? It's very hard to keep two things consistent if they can change independently. So they, this was like a lot of quality concerns. Like is my metric your same metric, right? Is the way I interpret, uh, let's say for example, a conversion rate, the way you interpret a conversion rate. So we were having a lot of this inconsistency and quality concerns, especially if you have two places who owns what, right? So basically establishing ownership was very difficult. So next slide, please. So we decided to think and framing the problem as a data mesh and data products problem. So on the left-hand side, 
we'll see the experimentation team providing a data product, right? And our data product need to answer the following questions, like who is exposed to which experiment, when, in which point in time, right? So this is an announced that only the experimentation team can answer these questions. Then we go to the domain teams, right? And the domain teams, they have expertise in the product domain. They also own a data product, right? That they're generating their metrics. And hopefully they offer a compatible schema. And then we are looking for a data set that, that can answer the following question, right? Like what is the value of a KPI per user who, and in a point in time, when, right? So we see that we have these commonalities of who and when. And whenever we see this dotted line, we see a, a domain boundary. So whenever we have a domain boundary, we require input and output ports. And the output port is basically this polyglot interface, you know, could be a database SQL query or could be some files in the data lake. And the input port is basically the code that is handling this information and actually making it interpretable. So next slide, please. So we decided to frame it in SQL, in a SQL way. And the idea is like, could be reduced to a very simple thing. Like if we have a join condition, right? Where we see per user, per certain time set and point in time for your experiment, I want to bring the value of a metric, right? So based in the top part, we see like the experiment ID and treatment ID. And then we see like, you can input your formula to calculate the metric value. And then we have a framework, like any metric can be described in the following way, right? So the users can provide a configuration. We can actually even reduce the, the like we can make it even simpler and reduce the complexity and provide, we actually provide a KPI configuration where the user just provides a YAML file with some information about the data product, like user time fields, their formulas, and we will interpret it using the experimentation stats engine. And we got inspired by using, there is a conference in the Strata, in the O'Reilly Strata conference in 2018 about Uber talking about this, this concept. So next slide, please. So it, how it looks like on the left-hand side, you see that someone will provide a file, like 20 lines more or less of YAML file. And on the top part, you will see things like the name of my table, if I have some join keys, the information of my join keys, and then they just need to provide the formula. Right, and they just provide small SQL. So still we want people to be able to test it locally as much as possible and to be as independent as possible. So we created an internal tool called KPI Vara, Capybara. And the idea is like people can just put the YAML file and we will generate all the boilerplate SQL for them, right? And we also support a Spark SQL and Trino SQL. So we automatically generate these queries for them and we they can just like locally start modifying the file, go and modify the query and copy then the changes to the file. So they can independently interact and test what's going on with their files all in their machines. When we go to production, we just interpret the file using the Spark Data Frame API so we can handle like low level optimizations. And um, then the user, we guarantee the user that we'll see exactly the same results they see on the, on the query they can run locally. So next slide, please. So now we have the new thinking and the thing is like, now if we see the dots, there is less blue. So let's experimentation involve. And it is now, now that we have a data product that is available, right? So the data product is handled by this team that is building the reporting, their dashboard, their day-to-day -day work. And now they can just download Capybara and test their configuration files locally and independently. Right? They can just start working when they are happy with the results they can submit the configuration file and for us it's basically building a PR in a repository. Um, then we basically approve as experimentation the, the, the KPI configuration and onboard it. And this approval part, because it's very standard, we can run a lot of testing. So we introduce a lot of automated testing of like verifying the schemas, verifying the tables, verifying like the queries are valid. And this led to a lot of benefits. So, you know, great reduction in time to onboard a metric also a lot of like, now it's a platform about independence and collaboration. So the idea is like now people together are building the experimentation platform, not just one team pushing all the time. Also, we have increasing trust, quality and lineage, right? So every metric now has a team that owns it and every metric is also depending on one configuration file. So we have a lot of traceability of what is being impacted whenever there is a change in the upstream. And quality increases, right? Because we can focus on having one single source of truth and everybody basically, we just need to fix the problem one time and experimentation also gets a benefit. 
And finally, we are compliant with the data mesh principles of this distribution of domain ownership. So we know who owns what and also what it's impacted and when. So hopefully, I, I hope you all like all this talk. Leave your questions in the, in the Q&A box down below and back to Luca. Thank you. I certainly like the talk. And I have to say, it, when you run thousands of experiments every year, having a platform like this that allows you to like, confidently look at your metrics and automate the process, it's absolutely essential. So let me go into um, my talk. And I want to do a little bit of a lighter talk here. And I want to give you like my personal, very personal perspective of why I think data, but largely speaking, data science and data science and data are so special at HelloFresh. And I think the reason is that we have three ingredients. Maybe next slide. The first one is the data, of course, which is as somebody brought the salt and, and in, in our like recipe. The second is technology and algorithms. And the third one is people. Let me go a little bit in more details regarding the, each one of these elements. Next slide. So which type of data do we have? On the one hand, we have customer data. We know from our customers their taste preference that we ask during the onboarding. We know their location. We enrich our data with demographics. We know their email. We track them online. So we know their cookie and device ID. And this constitutes very rich customer profiles that other similar business models, for example, traditional groceries, do not have. On the other hand, we also have, and if you go to the next slide, ingredients and recipes. So a very concrete physical product. And from our ingredients and recipes, we have a huge amount of data, both structured and unstructured. Structured data could be the cost, the weight, the size of specific ingredients, the inventory availability. But we can also play with a lot of unstructured data, like the recipe text or the recipes images, which are definitely very fun to play with if you use convolutional neural networks. At the intersection between the two, it's our digital product. The transaction of the users on our app that are purchasing these ingredients. And here we know the pricing history of the people, the transaction history. We are a subscription system, so we know their status of the customers. We know if they are active or inactive. And the customer provide through surveys, direct feedback, both on our digital uh, app and on our physical product via surveys. So this is our baseline ingredient, data. The next one is the technology and the algorithms that we deploy on top of this data. And here you see these images meant to represent how specific classes of algorithms are used either to minimize the cost of servicing our customers by improving our operational or marketing processes or to maximize the revenue by, for example, engaging more the users, recommending them the um, products that they love. We use state-of-the-art algorithms um, and even like a little bit more than state-of-the-art, yeah, I would say. So that goes in the direction of, you know, deep neural network, graph databases, and so on and so forth. All of, let me give you some concrete example of it in the next uh, slides. Our menu that you see on every week is actually algorithmically curated. And there is a, a, a linear optimization program that allows us to decide what's the optimal menu that makes most customer happy and uh, matches their taste profile constrained to a certain budget in terms of cost of ingredients. The outcome for the business is enormous. You can improve customer satisfaction and obtain a better order rate, but still lower and more menu costs, which is something that traditional grocery supermarkets cannot do. Next slide. Another example is our Bayesian models for media mix modeling. As a company, we invest tons of money into advertising and creating a knowledge for our brands worldwide. 
if you deploy so much budget in marketing, you want to make confident decisions. And here we partners with research labs like PyMC Labs, which are the author of the library for Bayesian inference called PyMC Tree, to develop a pretty cutting edge Bayesian model that allows us continuous refinement and validation of our marketing budget allocations and to deploy confidently hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing budget and lower our customer acquisition costs. Another example is the technology in the next slide, is the technology that we use. We have thousands of ML models deployed, optimizing different parts of our business. And we went from ungoverned models implemented on a laptop when I joined the company four years ago, to now an almost fully automated model life cycles based on pretty cutting edge ML ops stack. This allows us faster product cycles for our models, a much higher maintainability, and makes my data scientists much, much happier. The last ingredient I want to talk about is people indeed. And these um, people is grouped in three main departments at HelloFresh. Our data platform department that defines the company strategy around our data mesh, as you heard about, and our infrastructure, and provide reusable components to other teams. We have an AI and ML department that build production grade ML models and identifies new opportunities of optimizing the business using AI. And then we have the centralized analytics and data science teams that literally drive decision-making in every aspect of our business by providing reporting, experiments analysis, and generally speaking, identifying opportunities. Across all of them, we have cross-functional teams with data professionals of different skill sets. And you can imagine them as really different superheroes. We have data engineers, ML engineers, data scientists, analysts, and they're all grouped in families, which we call the data chapters that provide the consistent standard across the entire organization. In fact, we are investing even more into scaling up our technologies and data teams across these disciplines. And our target is to have an extra thousand new tech roles, probably two or 300 just in data by the next couple of years. In our main technology apps of Berlin, New York, Chicago, Sydney, and Boulder. So please check our career page at the end, you will find the link. And with that in mind, I'm gonna uh, lead this, ah, uh, next slide, please. So if you ask me what are the real ingredients of uh, HelloFresh success in data science and what makes it unique is the data that we use, the people that we employ and the technology and the algorithms that we use. And with that in mind, I'm gonna lead it to Jessica, our senior data scientist in our ML solution teams, that's gonna dive deeper in one particularly engaging and interesting algorithm, which is our recommendation mm -hmm. engine. Jessica. All right, thanks, Luca. Um, hi, everyone, um, I'm Jessica. And today I will be talking to you a little bit about um, how we at HelloFresh use um, recipe recommendation to boost customer engagement. So if we go to the next slide. So to kind of set the stage, why personalization in general, right? Um, well, as a weekly subscription service, um, we really want to make sure that, you know, in order to retain our customers, you know, <laughs> after going through the whole cycle of, you know, convincing them that this is a good product, we want to make sure that they're getting the best experience possible. So, you know, basically just like Ariana Grande and the GIF, you know, I want it, I got it. Um, that's really the value of that. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, that's the ideal scenario. Um, current state, it's a little bit more like, I want it, but have I got it? Maybe, maybe not. So part of our product entails that, you know, we need to kind of um, anticipate supply chain wise, 
you know, what types of ingredients that we get. And because of that, we tend to have default meals that we order more, like a larger volume of ingredients for. So unless a customer goes in on their page five days before the cutoff, they're sent three meals that, you know, will probably make most people pretty happy, but, you know, maybe if they had gotten a personalized email saying, hey, you know, I noticed that you've ordered a lot of ravioli dishes in the past, you know, so sort of like looking at the meals that this person, maybe me, actually likes, you know, maybe if I had gotten a notification like that, I would have done my meal choice or, you know, ideal state, perhaps those default meals would be switched to something that we believe that the customer either has tried and we know they like or hasn't tried yet, but we're pretty sure that they're going to enjoy it. So how do we kind of get to this place? If we go to the next slide, basically our role in data science is to kind of figure out, given the data that we have and what we know about our recipes, what we know about our customers, can we find even more recipes that are on the menu um, continually that our customers will love? And if we go to the next slide, basically our approach is kind of first starts with the customer side. So there are a couple of ways we could figure out, you know, the signals for which um, the kind of communicate a customer's preference towards meals, um, you know, in the login or just um, check flow to begin with, there are certain options that someone can choose for like, hey, I like low calorie meals, or I only eat these types of meat. So we have that type of information. But we also have interactions like basically every time you receive your box a couple of days afterwards, we send a survey saying, you know, what did you think of the meals? So if somebody rates a recipe a three or four out of four, um, that's probably a good sign that they enjoyed it. Um, another possible signal is repeat orders of the same sort of recipe. So um, that's another thing that we tend to look at. So all of that information is available to us. And then if we go to the next slide, um, we have the customer interactions, but now you know, how do we piece together um, the recipe related information? So what we can do, I mean, we have all this data about, you know, the recipe attributes such as what ingredients are in the recipe, what cuisine it is, um, how long does it take to cook, like so many other things. What we could do is build a graph that represents those relationships. And it's really interesting to kind of see it in that way. And taking that graph as an input, what we then do is train a graph-based neural network model to kind of learn from all of those relationships. And you know what that model is doing, even though it's trained to say, given this target node, let's say one of it is a recipe, what are the nodes that are likely to be found near it? Um, we don't really wanna use those end predictions. What we wanna do is use that hidden layer, which gives us vector representations of each of those nodes, which in effect gives us embeddings for our recipes. Um, so if we go to um, the next slide, you know, what does this look like for us? Um, how do we kind of even get to this model? Well, we use um, this node to vec implementation. So if any of you are familiar with word to vec, it's kind of the same thing, but for graphs. Um, so it takes a graph as an input. Um, so you can kind of see on the left, um, we have like lime green, some recipes. We have other nodes, which represents the attributes of those recipes. We feed that into the node to vec model, train it. And then as output, you get these recipe embeddings. And so in practice, what that looks like, you know, if we were to reduce them down to, in this example, a three-dimensional space, what we can see is something like this. So we have these blue recipe vectors. Um, they both look like they're facing in a similar direction. Um, they're both, <laughs> according to the titles, also pretty similar. They're steak, potato, kind of with a nice sauce, um, pretty similar looking. Another recipe that looks orthogonal to that would be um, this zucchini feta fritter pita. So pretty vegetarian, very unlike a steak and potatoes um, type of meal. So 
it makes us feel a little bit confident about that output. If we go to the next slide, um, just to kind of zoom out into just like what those various steps are um, with the node to vec model, we have our graph. Let's say that blue is one group of like recipes that are sort of a similar cuisine and similar, you know, prep time and all of that. And then we have another group of recipes um, and their attributes in orange. Well, what we could do is, you know, for each of these nodes in the graph, we have those edges connecting the graphs. So basically saying this recipe contains this ingredient or something like that. We walk across um, this graph, like taking a walk length, say of three in this example, and that way we get our input data. Then we use the model to kind of on that data to train and then fit. And then the output we get are the embeddings for each of those nodes. And what we kind of see is like the blue nodes seem to be clustered together. The orange nodes seem to be clustered together. Um, it kind of correctly picks up on the fact that there are some strong relationships among the blue and then some strong relationships among the orange, but not really so much in between. And then if we go to the next slide, let's see. Um, okay, so kind of, giving a little bit more context into what our graph really looks like for our use case. Um, here's just one example of a similar recipe pair that our model identified. So we have on the left a chicken breast over lemon parm spaghetti meal, and then we have a spaghetti chicken parm meal on the right. Um, we can see those in the lime green circles. All of those circles in the middle are different types of nodes, like representing all these types of things that are shared because there are edges from both recipes that are going to each of those attributes. There are a couple of attributes, you know, on one side or the other that are only present in one recipe, but for the most part, there's just a lot in common there. So probably if someone likes the recipe on the left, we can safely say, you know, they'll probably enjoy the one on the right too. So if we go to the next slide, you know, great, we have a model, it seems to be working, <laughs> um, you know, who cares? So, well, we have culinary and menu planning team for one. So these are the people who are figuring out, you know, what recipes do our customers enjoy? You know, maybe it turns out that there's a group of recipes that are very similar, but there's a small volume of them. But it seems that they're very highly rated among our customer base. You know, perhaps that's an area for further development. Um, then we have marketing. So kind of that idea of if you have a customer who has canceled the service for whatever reason, unfortunately, um, we can reach out to them and say, hey, based on your previous order history and your previous high ratings of, you know, this kind of meal, there's another meal like that coming up. So why don't you come, you know, we also have a discount for you, um, reactivate. We also have this as a place in digital products. So if we have an active customer looking to, you know, choose their meals, we can highlight the meals that we think they're going to like by putting some sort of favorite recipe badge next to it, um, just to make sure that they, you know, really get the experience that they deserve. Um, if we go to the next slide, so, what do we then do? You know, how do we get that information into those hands of the stakeholders? Well, so building an app really enables us to do that. So one example of the type of thing you could do is kind of have this sort of recipes ecosystem view. So the graph kind of uses those embeddings, projects it onto a 2D space, um, and each dot is a recipe. The closer two dots are, the more alike they are and vice versa. So you can kind of pick up like the person can hover over each of the dots and they can see, oh, there's a lot of bean Mexican, you know, vegetarian recipes. There are a lot of burgers in this. So it kind of also gives them confidence that like, hey, the model is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, um, as well as just like giving them a way to, you know, better their workflow and explore from themselves, you know, what is out there. And maybe if we just like hit a pause on that video, because I know I want to leave some time for questions. Just going to the next slide. If sometimes it like plays it again. <laughs> 
So key takeaways, I would say, you know, for one thing, I think I really learned from this project that any great data science project starts with, you know, a strong business need. So it wasn't just like one day we walked in and was like, hey, it would be nice to really like further our personalization. We also had the digital product team running A-B tests telling us that, hey, like if we do suggest a meal that someone's ordered before or rated highly before, conversion rates go up. So how do we expand that audience? And, you know, that's what they came to our team for. Um, another thing was kind of keeping an open mind about which data structures and modeling approaches we use. So, you know, a lot of times we think, okay, relational database, that's all there is. But for this use case, graphs were really great. Um, finally, you know, the idea of showing and not telling. I think anytime we want to kind of build and strengthen a relationship with our stakeholders, like having apps like this, um, it's just super great to make our model output more real to them. You know, it's not just like a bunch of scores sitting in a table. It's stuff that they can actually use to um, further the business. And, you know, there's a lot more out there. So I'm gonna pass it back to Luca to kind of wrap it up and elaborate on that. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. And thank you everyone for listening to us. I'm gonna open up to questions for now and we received so many. Uh, but I'm going to mention that if you're interested in learning even a bit more about HelloFresh, check out our Medium blog. We publish constantly articles about what we do in technology, engineering, and data science. And uh, I find some of the articles pretty interesting myself. <laughs>